Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome to this lesson. In this lesson, we are going to learn about another group of sexually transmitted diseases which are commonly encountered in the physician practice. These are the group of infections called as the urethritis. After this lesson, we are able to learn what is urethritis and pathogens causing urethritis and its laboratory diagnosis. This lesson will be covered under the headings of urethritis, what is its epidemiology, clinical features, etiology, complications and treatment and also about the pathogen in detail and its laboratory approach. Here let us consider a case, a male patient who came with a history of burning maturation of about 8 days duration and he also had purulent urethral discharge which just started 2 days ago. The details of his present illness are that the patient gave the history of having unprotected sexual exposure to a new partner and also the patient did not have any significant constitutional symptoms in the past or he did not receive any treatment for such complaints in the past. That was the case 1. Let us take another case. This lady who was 24 years old, commercial sex worker who actually walked into the clinic with the help of a walking stick. She complained of inability to walk since 2 to 3 days. She also had generalized joint pains which started about 10 days back and during this illness she also complained of swollen right knee. She was a commercial sex worker and she was regularly on oral contraceptive pills. She also gave a very significant history that she was treated in the past for pelvic inflammatory disease. For about 4 weeks long she received the treatment. She did not give any history of having trauma and also no other similar joint complaints in the past. On examination of this patient, the right knee was inflamed, it was swollen, there was no skin rash. On pelvic examination, the cervix was inflamed, it was red, it is also sometimes described as the mulberry cervix. On examination, she experienced pain, this is typically described as a cervical motion tenderness and also generalized pelvic tenderness was observed while examining. Now let us consider case number 1 and 2. The clinical diagnosis in case number 1 was made as urethritis. Let us also consider differential diagnosis here. It could be gonococcal urethritis, it can be due to chlamydia trachomatis, mycoplasma, urea plasma group of organisms or it can also result from infection by parasites like trichomonas vaginalis and also by gardnerella vaginalis. This is the clinical diagnosis in case 1. Let us consider the clinical diagnosis in case 2. In case number 2, as she came with the complaints of joint involvement, it was obviously the case of arthritis. However, in sexually active women, first reason what we could think is gonococcal arthritis. It could also be rheumatoid arthritis or gout. In these two cases, we have made the diagnosis clinically as urethritis and arthritis. However, we have to confirm clinical diagnosis with the laboratory findings so that specific treatment can be initiated especially in such cases because they are known to cause complications like infertility, strictures, etc. In case 1, we collected the urethral discharge on tip of a swab. The swab uh, should be very carefully chosen here because if we are thinking of gonococcal urethritis, 
the gonococci are highly delicate and sensitive organisms hence we cannot collect on the cotton material because fatty acids present in the cotton can inhibit their survival hence dacron or rayon material should be chosen when we choose the swabs swabs should be immediately transported to the laboratory and if we expect any delay it can be uh, put into a transport medium the swab itself can be inserted into a transport medium and like emis or triplicate soya broth or the stuart medium even if we expect a delay of about 1 to 2 hours if we put them in the transport medium they are safer and we can be transporting the same specimen to the laboratory for recovery of organisms this is uh, case number 1 in case number 2 we collected the joint aspirate after receiving these samples in the laboratory we have various modalities of diagnosis like microscopy culture serological method and some molecular rapid methods going with the microscopy which is very easy since we are suspecting a bacterial infection here microscopy and culture forms the mainstay of diagnosis clinical material what we had got were smeared onto the glass slides and examined after staining by gram stain the gram stain showed typically gram negative diplococci which were arranged in pairs that is the reason we call them as diplococci they were kidney shaped or bean shaped organisms which were facing their concave surfaces towards each other this was a very typical point which we noted under microscopy along with numerous pus cells now since we have the evidence of microscopy with us we can be more sure of the diagnosis here the case number 1 what do you think he is suffering from yes you are right he is suffering from gonococcal urethritis we made this diagnosis also taking into consideration the typical clinical presentation of dysuria urethral discharge and also having unprotected sex the gram stain nature also supported here in this case showing multiple pus cells and the gram negative diplococci what do you think is the case number 2 case number 2 is also we gave us the evidence of presence of gonococci in the joint fluid what are the points in favor of this case it is because of joint involvement which is common in young women the knee joint was swollen and inflamed she was a commercial sex worker and the gram stain also supported our clinical findings hence we made the diagnosis of gonococcal arthritis in this case by discussion of these two cases we are able to derive the points that gonococci may not only involve the local urethra but it can also be a disseminated disease it could enter into the vasculature can get into various parts of the body including the joints and can present as in our case too with the septic arthritis the physician was immediately informed about the diagnosis as soon as we got the evidence of the typical organisms in gram stain and i would like to stress here that it is very important to give the gram stain report as early as possible because we will be able to help the physician treat the disease in very specific manner after our report the physician started with the empirical therapy with penicillin we moved ahead with the lab diagnosis of culture because culture is quite easy and it is uh, it will give us the specific report in about uh, 18 to 24 hours the culture was attempted here both the samples were inoculated on chocolate agar however there are other media which are available like thayer martin agar martin levis agar which could also be used especially thayer martin agar should be preferred when the samples are coming from the contaminated areas like the genital area the material was inoculated on chocolate agar they were incubated in presence of carbon dioxide because these organisms are supposed to be capnophilic they would grow better in presence of 5 to 10% carbon dioxide so they were incubated in carbon dioxide jar for 18 to 24 hours at the end of incubation we observed that the colonies were tiny minute translucent which were grayish in color the smear was again made from these colonies and confirmed that they are gram negative 
cocci. For further identification of gonococci, we performed the following biochemical reactions. They were catalase positive, oxidase positive, which is very important point to be noted that organisms belonging to group Neisseria are oxidase and catalase positive. Further biochemicals like utilization of sugars were performed. We found that this particular organism oxidatively was able to utilize the sugar glucose only. One more point to compare and contrast is with the Neisseria meningitidis which is a common causative agent of meningitis. In case of Neisseria meningitidis, it is able to ferment both glucose and maltose whereas in Neisseria gonorrhea, it is not able to ferment the maltose sugar that is a differentiating point which we, we need to note. However, both are oxidase positive. After carrying out these important biochemical reactions, we were able to identify these organisms as Neisseria gonorrhea. Very important thing left out now is to carry out their antibiotic sensitivity testing is very very important especially in case of Neisseria as we know they have been developing resistance to the penicillin group of drugs. The sensitivity test was carried out supplemented Muller Hinton agar. Drugs which were used for testing were ceftrioxone, ciprofloxacin, nofloxacin, doxycycline etc. along with penicillin because the patient was already started on empirical treatment with penicillin. As we can note here that the organism was resistant to penicillin which was a very important finding that we had to inform physician immediately because line of treatment was changed. He was started with ceftrioxone along with azithromycin. Now what is the reason for starting with azithromycin because usually gonorrhea and gonococcal arthritis or gonococcal urethritis is usually associated with the infection by chlamydia group of organisms and they are very sensitive to azithromycin. It is almost taken for granted that both the infections coexist and it is good to treat them as though they are suffering also from chlamydial infections. Hence the line of treatment was immediately changed and ceftrioxone with azithromycin started in both the cases. The patients recovered well and we saved them from going into any further complications. Other methods are available for diagnosis. The serological methods easy and cheap and specific sensitive test is the ELISA test. It can detect both antigen and antibodies. Latex agglutination, heme agglutination and radio immunoassay are also available for serological diagnosis. The molecular methods though expensive they are highly sensitive, specific and rapid so, till now we have learnt about laboratory diagnosis of both the cases we came across. Moving further, let us learn more about the disease and Neisseria gonorrhea. Coming to the epidemiology of gonorrhea, it is the second commonest sexually transmitted disease. Humans are the only reservoirs. Women and Men can be equally affected, however, 50 percent of the infected women turn into carriers. The mode of infection is through sexual route. In women, cervicitis and urethritis are common and in men, more of the urethritis. However, oropharynx as well as the rectum can be involved. Not only the adults, but also the neonates can be affected with Neisseria this is going to happen when child is born to a to an infected mother and the presentation of the case will be within 1 to 2 days after birth this particular condition is called as ophthalmia neonatorum complications can result they are very well known not only the local regions can be involved but disseminated disease like as we came across in case number 2 can be present this usually happens when people are suffering from complement deficiencies. They can sometimes even present as gonococcal septicemia. Septic arthritis, skin involvement and pelvic inflammatory diseases are very well known complications especially in women salpingitis, bartholinitis and cervicitis are common. Fallopian tubes can be involved 
and stricture and fibrosis of fallopian tubes usually can lead into infertility. Let us learn about the morphology of this organism. They are gram negative diplococci. The size is 0 0.6 to 1 micrometer in diameter. They are typically kidney or bean shaped and they are non motile, non sporing. Neisseria gonorrhea is non capsulated, however, Neisseria meningitidis is capsulated organism. This is another point of differentiation between Neisseria gonorrhea and Neisseria meningitidis. Their arrangement is very peculiar. They are arranged such that their concave surfaces face to each other and they are always found in pairs. When we make a smear from the inflamed areas, we are going to see organisms most of the time intracellularly placed is shown in this picture. They are very fastidious organisms in the sense they are exacting in their requirements. They need enriched medium especially blood or chocolate agar and they need the atmosphere of 5 to 10 percent carbon dioxide for their growth. They are delicate organisms at the same time. They are quite sensitive to drying and also extremes of environmental conditions. That is the reason we need to take care when we are collecting the sample and transporting it to the laboratory. So, that these organisms survive on clinical material and we will be able to recover them in culture. What are their growth characteristics? They are fastidious as I said, they grow best on chocolate agar medium and also modified Muller Hinton agar. Thayer Martin medium and the modified Thayer Martin medium more selective and they are added with extra nutrients as well as antibiotics like vancomycin, cholestin and nystatin. They are facultative anaerobes, they are capnophilic as described. The colonies which they produce are of different types. They have been classified morphologically into T1 to T4 types. T1 and T2 are supposed to be smooth colonies and they are virulent strains and on repeated subculture type 3 and type 4 can be produced which become rough colonies and they non virulent. The biochemical reactions as we described during the lab diagnosis they are catalase positive, oxidase positive. They are able to utilize glucose sugar oxidatively, maltose sugar is not being utilized and this is a differentiating point between Neisseria gonorrhea and Neisseria meningitidis. Lactose and sucrose are not going to be oxidatively utilized. What are the virulence factors of this organism that makes this disease very deep as well as debilitating? Organism have got pili which help them in their attachment and also help these organisms to evade phagocytic mechanisms. The outer membrane proteins are also called as opacity protein thus named as OPA proteins. The pore protein is a kind of ligand which is present on the surface of Neisseria gonorrhea and it also helps in getting attachment and getting a foothold on mucosal cells. RMP proteins also help in attachment and also they have the antiphagocytic mechanism. Lipo oligosaccharides antigens are also equally important. They usually have a kind of endotoxic effect. Organisms also produce IgA protease enzymes which are going to cleave IgA. Antibiotic resistance is another uh, good armor present with these organisms that they are going to be resistant especially against the beta lactam antibiotics. So, these are all the virulence factors which help the organisms to gain upper hand during infections. Let us see once these organisms have made entry what is the pathogenesis. As we see here first they adhere with the help of uh, different virulence factors as described. They are going to enter into the cells they are going to be taken up by endocytosis and also they have the capacity to penetrate and with the help of pili they get attachment and they enter into the cells. Once they enter into the cells they start multiplying because they are going to be not getting acted upon by the lytic action inside our protective cells. They go further multiply and they are going to get deeper into sub epithelial surface where they 
also start producing endotoxins because of their gram negative nature lipo oligosaccharides are going to help them to establish inflammation and also call for many other inflammatory mediators and thus sets up inflammation. This is mechanism of pathogenesis in Neisseria gonorrhea. Let us look into some clinical presentations. In male as said they are going to be mainly presenting as urethritis. As a complication of urethritis they can develop uh, urethral strictures. Other than that they can have periurethritis and periurethral abscesses, small abscesses which may actually break up open as ulcers and this particular condition can be resulting in oozing of pus which is typically described as the water can perineum. Males can also suffer as a complication epididymitis, prostatitis, proctitis and also conjunctivitis. This is due to auto inoculation from the infected hands. Let us see what are the clinical presentation in females. Urethritis is not very common than cervicitis. Cervicitis going to be giving us the clue that during pelvic examination there is a typical cervical motion tenderness which is important clinical sign and also the inflamed red cervix called as the mulberry cervix which is another important clinical sign. Pelvic inflammatory disease can result if it is left untreated, starts as urethritis, cervicitis, it could spread into the surrounding tissues causing pelvic inflammatory disease. As a result of PID result into infertility because of involvement of fallopian tubes, ectopic pregnancy and fitz curtis syndrome. This syndrome is described as the perihepatitis or liver capsule is going to be inflamed in this. Neonates can be infected soon after birth is called as ophthalmia neonaterum. These are various clinical presentations in case of gonorrhea. Let us come to the treatment of gonorrhea. Neisseria gonorrhea are known to be resistant to penicillin. More than 30 percent of the isolates are reported to be resistant to penicillin. Hence, we have to use third generation cephalosporin like ceftriaxone as a drug of choice. Quinolones can also be used. However, recently the resistance against these group of drugs have also been reported. As I already said that whenever we come across gonorrhea, we have to also keep in mind that the patients may be suffering from long standing chlamydial infections. They are usually known to coexist. In such case, the recommended treatment is we can start with cephalosporin like ceftriaxone and combined with 1 gram oral azithromycin or doxycycline for 7 days. After giving about 7 to 14 days of uh, treatment, the patients will usually recover and it is quite easy to treat gonorrhea than any other sexually transmitted infections because actually single dose of ceftriaxone can take care if it is only a case of gonorrhea. How do we prevent such infections? Safe sexual practices. It is also important to screen high risk women. Screening of pregnant women is important to prevent ophthalmia neonatorum. And also if we are expecting ophthalmia neonatorum, then it is important to give prophylactic eye drops of erythromycin in the children. So now in this class we have studied an important sexually transmitted disease that is gonorrhea. We have studied in detail about the organism as well as lab diagnosis of such cases. Some take home points at the end, gonorrhea is a treatable sexually transmitted disease. Penicillin resistance is known in gonorrhea, so we have to keep in mind treatment with cephalosporin. Rule out the infection in high risk groups by screening and also always remember that they can coexist with chlamydial infections and both the infections pave the way for other sexually transmitted diseases like HIV or hepatitis B infections. So, screening for all of them is going to be an important take home message in uh, gonorrhea. Thank you very much.